They are Geelong, the greatest team of all. Cats fans, stand up to your full height and celebrate this champion team. Tears flowed for Cats veterans. After a decade featuring five preliminary final defeats and a grand final loss, Geelong finally reigned supreme. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. So the Geelong Cats are the 2022 AFL Premiers after smashing the Swans before a capacity crowd at the MCG. Sadly, it wasn't much of a game and the TV ratings were way down on last year. But despite that, it was a far better advert for the sport than what we saw in the lead-up. Hawthorne Racism Bombshell. Racism Storm. Footy's most shameful day. That story hijacked the headlines in Footy's most celebrated week. And who spoiled the party? Well, it wasn't the Hawks who commissioned the review into the treatment of its Indigenous players, or the AFL, which had a copy. It was an investigation by award-winning ABC sports writer Russell Jackson, which landed with an ugly thud on Wednesday morning. Hawthorne racism review to allege that former coaches separated First Nations players from families and demanded a pregnancy termination. Clarkson just leaned over me and demanded that I needed to get rid of my unborn child. And that night, the shock story led Melbourne's primetime bulletins. There's breaking news tonight as the AFL faces a racism bombshell. The AFL has been hit with one of the most harrowing sets of allegations the code has seen. One of the most disturbing controversies in the history of the game. Which is saying something. With Nine's Brooke Boney writing in the Herald. I'm terrified that this game I love and speak so proudly about is harbouring something I'd be ashamed of. And on Fox Footy, former AFL star Eddie Betts was revealing the racism he still faces. I was at a pool and the lifeguard came up to me and told me that I needed to get out of the pool. I was holding my kid, my, my baby in my hand with my two twins riding around and, and I found out that two old white elderly couple told the lifeguard to tell me to get out of the pool because I, I was making their grandchild uncomfortable. And that, That's just, and that just made me feel like I don't belong here in Australia because these issues keep occurring. The allegations in the report left sports reporters outraged and calling for action, but with one important caveat. Now, if these allegations are proved to be correct, then surely, surely Alastair Clarkson, for starters, will never coach again. If they are proven, and perhaps even if they are not. The coaches who stand accused have denied being in the meetings and or making the demands. And they were neither interviewed by investigators nor privy to the allegations. So, not surprisingly, some commentators cried trial by media. This is very fraught with danger. We have to give these people the right to natural justice, as you pointed out. And it concerns me that these allegations are put out, there's a pile on in the media, and we haven't even seen the other side of the story yet. Or, as Andrew Bolt suggested, of the ABC's motives... Now, all that we do know is what the ABC has reported, and we know the ABC does have a strong race agenda. Let's wait to hear both sides of that story before damning Hawthorne as racist. But again, when did our media ever wait for that? Who dares wait? Because if you wait, you might be called a racist too. So, did the coaches get fair treatment and a fair chance to respond? On Nine, Eddie Maguire, who apologised for his own racism scandal after likening Adam Goods to King Kong back in 2013, suggested they didn't. I'm told that Russell Jackson went to all parties on Monday with some of the allegations. Yeah, but that, my understanding from Brisbane respond. was that it was, it was sent to Brisbane to the general number uh, at, uh, on yeah, the email. The, the... That, as Jackson fired back on Twitter, was wrong and an attempt to smear his reputation, saying he had sent detailed questions to Chris Fagan with 24 hours' notice, but that Fagan did not respond to email or phone messages. Jackson tells us the same process, direct emails, follow-up calls and messages, was followed with the other coaches involved. Now, the allegations from the review were clearly news, and what the players and families allege, and Jackson spoke to them personally, was also news. So, if mud now sticks unfairly, it's the AFL and club who bear the blame for not giving the coaches the chance to answer the allegations. All in all, it is a masterclass in how not to manage a crisis. But now to London and the global event that wiped out almost everything else in the news. The late, most high, most mighty and most excellent monarch, Elizabeth II. For 12 days straight, the media went all in on the funeral of the century and shamelessly exploited every royal angle, no matter how absurd. 
You've got the King's the King's hair. D The King's DNA <laughs> is currently being held in Geelong. Who knew? And when the morning period finally ended last Tuesday, it's hard to know who was most exhausted, the audience or the journalists. Well, what a 10 or 12 days it has been. An absolute privilege for us to be involved in this. But amid the orgy of adoration for the most loved woman in the world... One, two, three... Oh. There was also a steady stream of spite for one of the most hated. Megan freaking Markle. I think an Australian would say she's just full of it. She's a tosser. Oh. She's a total tosser. That's how we would describe her. <laughs> Welcome to the world of Megan bashing, where anyone can join in, even politicians. I'm sick of both of them. Uh, I sort of long for the day where I hope Harry rolls over one day, takes one look and thinks, what have I done, and comes to his senses and <laughs> oh, up and moves back across the pond. <laughs> I think he's made an awful error uh, and I think she's... Uh, well, I think she's had a terrible influence over him and it's, she's just a horrible human. They're, they're awful, revolting, revolting people. A horrible, revolting human. Is Meghan really that bad? And does Holly Hughes need to say so on TV? But with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex back in the UK for the Queen's funeral, it's been open season again on the runaway royals, who are variously accused of petulance, arrogance, treachery and hypocrisy on even the slimmest of evidence. Take this seven-second Twitter clip, widely shared and viewed millions of times, of Meghan accepting flowers from the crowds at Windsor. An innocuous moment, not according to the media. Rude Meghan Markle moment with aid caught on camera. With Seven News telling us that the Duchess of Sussex actions... ...divided the internet. And who was it who dubbed her rude? Seven had that from an impeccable source. She certainly looks dismissive and rude. One Twitter user wrote. No need to get a second opinion there or look for further proof. But as Nine Sylvia Jeffries said last week, the Duchess just can't win. Where the aide comes up and asks, can I put the flowers down for you? And she says, no, I told this person that I would do it for them uh, myself. She was called a passive-aggressive di diva across many media outlets because of that. And that diva is also devious, the media told us, citing the internet once more and the suspicious lump in her dress that sparked an insane online theory that Meghan was secretly carrying a microphone and recording material for her new Netflix show. And look, there's the evidence. Yes, that is it. Backed up with more choice quotes from Twitter nobodies. I can't believe she is recording this. She is just a vile and toxic woman. I'm finally done. Megan wearing a mic was my last straw. Once again, no proof needed to run the story. Because if it's on Twitter, that is the story. And never mind if it's not fair or untrue or even insane. And what about the crime of Harry and Meghan holding hands at the Queen's memorial service? In a sea of reverential coverage, that was also scorned by the commentariat. They're not teenage sweethearts. Like, it's not cute. She's 41, he's 38. They're far too old to be doing that. They also have two kids and they're members of the aristocracy. Like, as you say, time and place. It's not cute, it's not sweet, it's just kind of weird, and I'm sort of sick of it. Day after day, as Harry and Meghan joined the world in mourning the Queen, social media bitched and moaned about their every move. And the mainstream media harvested the hate and served it up as news. Like with this story on Meghan's facial expressions during the Queen's service. Was she smirking or smiling? And what about her supposed crocodile tears for the cameras? Meghan Markle knew tears would be photographed as face lacked genuine emotion. Who says? Well, everyone. On GB News, Tom Bauer, the author of a book on Harry and Meghan, was asking... Well, was she emotional back then? I mean, when she allegedly touched a tear or was it an act of a Hollywood uh, actress thinking I'd better do a, a gesture to suggest a tear? The only person that Meghan, I think, at the moment is crying for is for herself. Uh, certainly not for the Queen. Now, it's fair to say the Duchess has in some ways made herself an easy target and some of the criticism may be justified. She courts publicity and she's turned her war with the royals into a money-making machine, reportedly pocketing $25 million for her podcast series, which led the New York Post to whack her on the front page. Toddler and tiara. Spoiled Princess Meghan, still whining about royal family. With the Post's columnist, Maureen Callaghan, pronouncing... 
She has nothing to offer, no original thoughts or guiding philosophy, no earthly reason to be taking so much money from and so much space in the mainstream media she so clearly reviles. And when Markle compared herself to Nelson Mandela in an interview with New York magazine The Cut, she gave the green light for another pylon. This is a narcissism off the scale. I mean, it's just astonishing, a six and a half thousand word sort of, uh, you know, diatribe against the royal family. Almost everything this woman says is like a car crash in Paris <laughs> waiting <laughs> to happen. Ouch. That Paris crash being a reference to Princess Diana's death. So, where does it come from, this torrent of hate? As an investigation by Twitter analytics service bot Sentinel revealed late last year, Marco was the victim of an orchestrated campaign of harassment, with 70% of the content coming from just 83 accounts. As BuzzFeed reporter Ellie Hall explained... What you have here are accounts whose only purpose, it seems, is to tweet negative things about Meghan and Harry. Among those, Meghan was never pregnant. She used something called a moon bump to fake her pregnancies. And Archie and Lily, their two new children, or their new daughter, they were either born via surrogate or their dolls. All nonsense, of course. But what the research did not provide was any clear motive for the attacks. Like, what is the goal? Do you just want her to kill herself? Do you want them, you know, Harry to divorce her and come back? But there's no clear goal here. It's just hate. But the next question is, why do the mainstream media recycle it all? And the answer? For the same reason that Markle is paid $25 million for her podcast. The public has an insatiable appetite for royal stories, however trivial they may be. And as any student of the media would know, the tabloids thrive on bringing other people down. But now, to some great news. Global warming is not to blame for all the floods, fires, droughts and heat waves that are happening all over the world. And who says? Our old friend Graham Lloyd at The Australian, who has this big story on pages one and two of The Weekend Oz nine days ago. No emergency shown in climate records. An international study of major weather and extreme events has found no evidence of a climate emergency in the record to date. Wow, what a relief. And given that Graham Lloyd is environmental editor of The Australian, it must be true, yes? Well, there certainly is a study by scientists in Italy and as Sky's Chris Smith told us in a clip that now has 375,000 views, it did indeed find... No evidence of a climate emergency in the records to date. No evidence. The study analysed data from heat, drought, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes and ecosystem productivity and could not plot a trend either up or down. So, luckily, we can all relax. But hold on just a minute, because the study appeared in the European Physical Journal Plus, which is a little-known journal that rarely publishes work on climate change. And it's also eight months old, yet not reported by any mainstream media. So why did the Australian suddenly write it up? Perhaps because it came up two days earlier in a climate sceptic blog. Climate emergency not supported by data, say four leading Italian scientists. And possibly because that was then tweeted out by the well-known climate sceptics at Net Zero Watch. So, who are these Italian scientists that have reached this stunning conclusion? Well, despite Christmas insistence on Sky... Now, these authors are not climate deniers. In fact, they say we should prepare for a possible increase in disasters and do not say that no action should be taken on climate change. They're not deniers. Three of the four scientists are well-known climate sceptics. Lead author Gianluca Alimonti is a nuclear physicist who has denied there is any scientific consensus on man-made global warming. Franco Prodi has suggested man-made global warming is not a problem. And Prodi and Renato Ricci were both involved in the controversial World Climate Declaration promoted here in Australia in 2020 by Craig Kelly MP. Now surely this was something Graham Lloyd and the Australian ought to have told their readers. But instead, Lloyd and his Sky News colleague Chris Kenny who celebrated the study's findings with the strapline climate emergency hysteria debunked, insisted it had nothing to do with denial. As you would like to point out, and I would like to point out, this doesn't mean we deny climate change or we deny that some action shouldn't be taken, but it does, this study does disprove the idea that we're living in a catastrophe already. It certainly does, Chris. 
In fact, the study proves nothing at all, and certainly not that. And one of Australia's top climate scientists, the ANU's Professor Mark Houghton, was scathing about it, telling MediaWatch... The article is not only selective in relation to the science aspects, but also in relation to regional coverage. It has such a US and Europe feel, and it seems like the Southern Hemisphere, Asia and Africa don't exist. And on Twitter, a concerned scientist was one of several people to denounce its claims, writing... The paper is debunked on droughts here, floods here, extreme precipitation and heatwaves. And sure enough, those links go to articles in leading scientific journals like American Meteorological Society, Nature and Science, which conclude that large heat waves, global droughts and their intensity, and floods have been made worse and more frequent by climate change. And that's also the conclusion reached by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which stated last month... Human-induced climate change, including more frequent and intense extreme events, has caused widespread adverse impacts and related losses and damages to nature and people beyond natural climate variability. And that, in turn, is backed up by an analysis from Carbon Brief, which reports that... Scientists have published more than 400 peer-reviewed studies looking at weather extremes around the world, from wildfires in the US and heat waves in India and Pakistan to typhoons in Asia and record-breaking rainfall in the UK. The result is mounting evidence that human activity is raising the risk of some types of extreme weather, especially those linked to heat. So, we asked Graham Lloyd and his editor Chris Dorr why they did not highlight any of those studies or conclusions, or mention them in the article, and why they failed to tell readers of some of the author's history of climate scepticism. They did not respond. But you have to wonder why the Australian Let's Its Environment editor cherry-pick claims from climate sceptics and deniers and publish them without challenge from the vast majority of climate scientists who say they are wrong. That's all from us for tonight. There's more on our website. And don't forget our latest episode of Media Bytes on Facebook, YouTube and iView. But for now, until next week, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>